the Bible says that the Lord created the heaven and the earth, something happened to cause the earth to become void. Now, when we're talking about this in a specific context, we understand that at this particular point in the creation, that there was darkness and there was voidness, and, and what we see today was not here. No trees, no birds, no, no, no water, no oceans, no sea life, and all of the things that it takes place for the earth to be such a beautiful place in which we live. But as we understand that something caused it to take place, uh, the very care that God put into his creation, speaking it into existence and the plan plants growing and, and, the, and the land moving and the waters uh, bringing forth the, the, the animals. And, 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 and I just can't imagine what it must have felt like the very first time a humpback whale popped up through the ocean and shot one of them sprays into the air. I, I drive down our, our landscape sometimes, Brother Richardson, and, and I'm trying to imagine what this must have looked like before man got a hold of it and put highways and buildings and all of these things. How, how beautiful it must have been and majestic it must have been, Brother Fairman, to, to see the Rocky Mountains for the very first time uh, as they began to fall and all of these beautiful things that God had put into place, uh, the care that he took into place. Uh, and when the day was done, the Bible says that he looked at it and saw that it was good. It was good. He put it in place. The stars, the moon, the sun, the day, the night, he separated them. He, he did it according to his will. But when it came to a man, Sister Lisa, he didn't just speak you into existence. He carved out your fingernails. He made your eyelashes. He, 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 he made your nose, your, your eyes, your, your face. He, he formed you. And then he took and he breathed into your nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And they enjoyed a communication day in and day out in the cool of the evening where man would come and visit God and God and them would commune together and speak together. It was all for a relationship, you see, because he had created beautiful beings before and he had developed them for a certain specific situation, uh, but because they were created to worship him and not have a choice, there was no real relationship between those. Nothing that you could just set in concrete and say or nothing you could set in stone and say. And, and when, the, when the enemy Lucifer fell and he, he went his direction because he thought he could exalt himself above God, God said, I've got something to show you, Lucifer. I've got something that's better than you are. And so he created man. And what the enemy thought was, if I can get what God loves to fall, then that would show I am higher than who he is. That slippery serpent slithers into the garden. How beautiful it must have been, how gorgeous it must have been, how awesome it must have been to see what God was able to do in that beautiful midst uh, uh, where there needed to be no rain. It was never too hot nor too cold. You didn't have the sun beating down on you and, and causing your skin to age and have age spots and, and, and be wrinkled and withered and like leather. You didn't have all of those type of situations growing in, you know, where you had to get up and put so much hairspray in your hair and, and, and wash your... It was just such a beautiful thing just to get up and walk outside. You didn't have to get out there and cut your fingers making sure your, your, your beautiful plants were doing what they were supposed supposed to do they just did it a mist came up from the ground to water the plants how awesome is it to understand what God really intended but something happens to make things void see when I read Genesis chapter 1 verse number 2 
I, I see the creation, but what I also see is where we as a soul are without God. We're void and dark. We're lost. We don't have the ability to function. We don't have the ability to do the things on our own. And it takes the Spirit of God to move upon the face of what we are to make us into something. His care, His detail, the, the very heartbeat of God to reach down into this creation. He could have wiped it off the face of the earth as a potter does something that's not quite working correctly, taking it and off the wheel and putting something back on there that's workable. No, that's not how God does it. If, if you like you're unworkable this morning, if you feel like your life is with Him, you can't be worked upon. God's not going to take you off the potter's wheel. God's not going to take you and throw you in a trash can. God's not going to get rid of you. He may apply some things to you to allow you to be workable again. He may take you off and beat you a little bit and rework you a little bit to put you back on there. But my God is not the one that's going to take you and throw you away. But He's going to develop you and make you into what you want to be if you want follow after his word and even when his creation doesn't listen don't eat of the tree <laughs> I mean it would be easy in Pentecost today if we only had one rule right don't eat of that tree. I think we could all make it. Be real easy. No. See, new rules get made because old ones are broken. Why do you think that they have this manual this thick at a job that you get hired at just to flip burgers? Because old rules were broken, so they had to make new ones to try to keep you from breaking those. I'm not saying this because I'm going to throw out a bunch of rules you have to follow. I'm saying this because the reason the Word of God is this thick is because He's giving you a path to get back to the simple thing. Don't eat of the tree. That was the only rule that he had. The very simplest of everything that God designed for us is don't do that that I've asked you not to do. That's it. But unfortunately, because we're human, we make mistakes. I make them, you make them. We fall flat on our face, we stump our toes. We, we, we fail God miserably. Brother Lewis, if, if we had to make it upon our own ability, we wouldn't have a shot. There's no way, as sweet as the Shelley sisters are, that they would make it upon their own ability. There was no way that anybody could make it on what they can do. Because we're all null and void. Without God. But even in their despair of where they had fallen, and God comes into the garden and He is listening for Adam, and Adam is not there, and He's listening for Eve, and she's not there, and He calls to them, and finally they say, Here we are. Where have you been? Well, we were hiding. He makes a promise. He tells them that of her seed, we're going to bruise the enemy. See, God loved us so much that even from the very foundation of the world, He already had a plan in place for what the enemy meant to be evil. God turns it into something good. You're never alone. You're never by yourself. There's always a plan in place. 
Moses is called to deliver the people from, 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 from their bondage. But the plan was in place long before he ever was made to call from the burning bush. His mama had no clue who he was when she took him and laid him in that ark and put him in the bulrush. She had no clue that God had a calling for that baby boy, that there was going to be a day in which he would stand before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. She had no clue who he was. Pharaoh had no clue because he allowed his daughter to raise the very one that would come back to be a thorn in his side. Let me tell you something, friend. You do not know who you are until you allow God to get a hold of you and use you for His purpose. baby cry calls out to Pharaoh's daughter she picks him up knowing that the law was they were all to be killed but what harm is one little baby no clue that the mother or the, the woman that she called to feed him was his own mother and however long it took her to wean him, there was something put inside of him that you're going to live with Pharaoh, but you're not of Pharaoh. Reminds me of another scripture, doesn't it? You're going to be in the world, but you're not of the world. <laughs> Friend of mine, you're not your own. You don't belong to yourself. It's not your choice, your desires, your will. It's His will, His desires, His choices. He's already bought you with His own blood. He paid for you, but not because He wants you to be a slave to Him, but because He loves you. Of all the religions that are out there, Christianity is the only one that says it's free. If you look at Buddha or, or Hinduism or any of those, you've got karma or the eight steps to tell you to do. In order for you to use your, your, your virginity, but not in God, all you have to do is just follow the plan of salvation, and that's all that you have to do in order for you to be saved. Uh, let me tell you something, friend. Uh, my God loves you. He cares for you. He desires to see you saved. Uh, it's up to you whether or not you follow through with what He's called. And he puts a plan into place. People have a tendency not to listen. I, even more so in this day and age. I, we all have our weaknesses, we all have our failures. And what happens a lot of times is because of our weaknesses and our failures, we give up on God. That's the first thing we cut out of our life. I'm preaching to somebody. That should be the thing we put more into our life. He is the only one that loves you unconditionally. He's the only one that really desires to see you do well. Oh, but if he really did love me, he would do such and such. Well, if you really loved your kids, you'd feed them ice cream at 2 o'clock in the morning. We say that as a funny thing, but that's the truth. No, it's not. Why don't we feed them ice cream at 2 o'clock morning? Because, because of them. This isn't good for you. They don't know that. But he loves you. That's why you don't get your cake and be able to eat it too sometimes. Sometimes you've got to let it set and marinate. Sometimes you've got to let it. I would love to be able to go home, pull chicken out of the refrigerator, and it's done. 
It don't work like that. You got to have somebody like my wife that takes the time to marinate the chicken breast in Italian dressing overnight. I thought of that. I would have cooked it and poured Italian dressing, but you don't get the flavor in the meat. See, God looks at you and he says, what you need tomorrow, I'm putting in the oven today. What you need for next week, I'm cooking right now. What you're going to need next year, I'm already planting the seed for it to grow. You can take the apple and eat it right now, or you can take the seed and plant it and have thousands of apples uh, to eat later on. But it's up to you. If we eat it right now, we have nothing for tomorrow. But if we'll just wait uh, and let it nurture and let it marinate and let it grow and let it sprout up uh, and put roots down, uh, then we have a solid foundation into what God desires for our lives. And I can't wait that long, Brother Eves. I need an answer right now. I'm in trouble right now. I, I, I can't get through this trial right now. What can I do about right now? Well, let me take you to a boy who had been anointed king, who was on his way to do nothing more than defeat his brothers who were at war. He gets there hearing the decree of the enemy about how horrible God is and his red blood begins to boil. How dare this uncircumcised Philistine talk about my God this way? Who does he think he is? I'm going to do something right now. But what he did not realize is that the training he had taken to throw his sling, that the things that he had already been through with the bear and the lion, that his abilities had already been placed in him that had taken over 17 to 18 years for them to develop inside of him, for him to have the ability at that moment, not taking the hundreds of years it took uh, for God to run water over those stones uh, to make them smooth enough uh, that they could fly through the air without any restriction at the moment in which God wanted to, I'm not preaching deep, I'm just telling you what God does, he had placed those stones in a perfect spot in which David would choose them for the moment in which he needed them, friend of mine when you make your decision to act there have been things that God has put in place for year after year, time after time for you to use at the moment you make your decision but it's because of God's love and his mercy that he gives it to you at that moment somebody praise him right now oh we can do better than that folks somebody praise him right now oh. see because we're such a microwave generation we fail to realize that there's some preparation that has to take place. You don't just get to preach general conference. You don't just get to stand up in front of 10,000 people. Lord, you don't even just get to come and get the Holy Ghost. There was some preparation that took place to get you here. Now, you may have just showed up, but God's prepared this over a period of time for you to have that moment. The preparation's not always on your part. It may be on the other part, but God's prepared. He's desiring. He's always looking for that opportunity to do it. There's some of you in this place today that just this week 
you've asked yourself, does God really love me? We had some great services around this place this week. Some of you were here, some of you weren't. I saw some of you scatter like roaches when you began to pray for people. Just kidding. We're so, how shall I put this? We're so worried about the unknown. If I make this commitment, where's tomorrow going to take me? If I decide to accept the love of the Lord, what's that going to do for me? What are my friends I'm going to lose? What, 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 you know, am I going to lose my family? Am I going to lose my loved ones? Am I going to lose those folks? For God so loved the world, He loves them as much as He does you. But when He places it in front of you, it's for your choice, not theirs. I've talked to people that said, I can't choose your way because if I choose your way, I'm putting grandma in hell. Well, let me tell you something. There's no way you can put grandmama in hell. That's not our choice. The word is the same as 500 years ago as it is right now. That doesn't change. But it's up to a God who loves her. But to whom much is given, much is re... The Lord gives you that chance because He may be calling you to something great. You may be that baby boy that He's placing in the ark right now. The enemy's out to kill you and destroy you. The enemy's out to rip you apart and tear you down. The enemy's out to, to literally suck the life out of you. And there you are, helpless, floating in an ark, waiting for that individual to come that had no clue what you are or who you are to pull you out and give you an opportunity. It's interesting enough to understand this one thing. They were throwing the babies to the crocodiles. Where did crocodiles live? Water, right? Where did they put him? Water. <laughs> what the enemy meant for evil... God said, you can put your crocodiles anywhere you want to. I'm going to put my Savior right there in the middle of them. <laughs> you do what you want to do, devil. I've already got a plan in place. I've already got something going on. What, they didn't, what, what the enemy didn't realize was is that at the exact spot that the Lord told that mama to put that ark, whether she knew that's what God said or not, that's where God wanted it. That Pharaoh's people, because his daughter needed to take a bath, was out there slapping the waters earlier to drive away the crocodiles. Just, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but just think about this. You're going to go to the river to take a bath. I want somebody to go down there and scare off the beasts. God's already prepared because he loves you. He cares. He desires to see you saved. He desires that on that day in which he looks at you in your eyes and says, well done. Well done. Well, but what did I do, Lord? <laughs> All you had to do is be faithful. Over a few things. <laughs> That's all that I asked of you. And you were faithful. Whether it's one talent, three talents, five talents, it doesn't make a difference. You were faithful. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many things. 
the love of God and the preparation that he takes and the things that he does to get you into an area that he can reach into your life and change it. How many of you ever had sourdough bread? From my understanding, it, you can't just cook sourdough bread. You have to take the bread You have to take a bit of that dough and store it somewhere. And then when you make your new batch of dough, you have to take that old dough to put in that dough and then let it set for a few days, maybe weeks, I don't know, to allow it to sour before you cook it. Then when it comes, you know, but you take a piece of that that you've made and set it aside for the next time. See, whoever makes sourdough bread has to understand that. Because me, I'm going to cook the whole thing, then I'm not going to have sourdough the next time. God gives us something that He's prepared, but sometimes He holds a little bit back. Because you're going to need it tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And, but if you're faithful over what he gives you right now, if you're faithful over what he's got for you at this moment, if you're faithful over those things, uh, he's going to keep feeding you the love. Uh, but if you're not faithful, guess what? He's going to start cooking up more sourdough bread uh, and sending it your way that he might appetize you to come back into his presence uh, so that you can understand that he loves you. His desires. Isaiah 9 and 6. His desires for you. Starts in the beginning. Prophesied in the middle. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He took that seed that he told Eve and marinated it for 4,000 years to let us know, I'm coming! And there's not a devil in hell that's going to stop me. And then that midnight cry and that moment in which he was born and they, and they smacked his bottom and he began to cry and breathe that air. There had never been a cry like that in the world before. There had never been a situation in which the world understood where the stars began to bow. The sheep began to bow. The angels came out and began to proclaim. Shepherds began to travel miles. Wise men traveled for days to get to the point in which that baby had cried for the first time. Why? Because the cry in which that baby cried was I'm here world and I love you and I'm ready. The enemy tried to destroy him. The enemy tried to kill him. Nope. God said you know what? I'm going to take him back to the shores in which I'd sent my first savior and let him know that he is there because I love him as well. And he develops and he grows and he matures and one day guess what he said it is finished. See, the wrath of God the world has never seen like Jesus saw it. There has never been a man beaten like that man was beaten. The entire wrath of God that rained upon him that day and that night. Let me tell you something, folks. Hollywood can't recreate what happened that day. No history book can tell you what happened that day. 
They can give you an idea, but they can't tell you. The only one that really knows the amount of pressure that was placed was the one that had to endure the pressure. Every lie that has been told, every dollar that has been stolen, every adulterous fornication affair, every cheating, embezzlement, Every drunken situation, every homosexual affair, every sin in the entire world from beginning to end was placed on his shoulders. I don't know about you, but that's the love. That's love. What he said was, is you don't have to do this. I'll do it for you. (laughs) The law says they should have been stoned. Jesus said, I'm going to do one better than stoning them. I'm going to get beat. I'm going to be whipped. I'm going to be cursed. I'm going to be sped upon. I'm going to have a crown of thorns in my head. I'm going to be taken to a cross, nailed to it, and I'm going to hold on to it with love. could have called legions upon legions of angels to come and wipe them out no you know why because brother Morris he saw your face sister Johnson he saw your face sister Tracy he saw your face Gary he saw your face The fairman, he saw you. And even if it was just you four or five that I called that he did it for, that was enough for him. He saw face after face, after face after face, after face. Has your sin rushed upon him? Think about what you've done wrong. And he knew it before you were ever even born. And he said, that's okay, I'm going to take it. I'm going to put it under my blood. And all you have to do is accept it. That's it. There's not a thing in this world that you can do that God cannot cover it. You know why? Because it's already been covered. The only thing that keeps you from being able to be in a situation in which you can see what God can do is if you don't step under the blood yourself. Because he loves you. He cares. His desire to see you saved is so great that he was willing to do it himself. There was no man able to redeem. So you know what he does? He creates himself a body engulfs that body with his spirit and says, I'll do it myself. Angels step back and watch as the Lord of glory gets off of his throne and goes to live among the humans. (laughs) And the compassion that drove him the compassion that welled up in him as he looked at the crowds upon crowds upon crowds I I can't imagine having to be as exhausted as Jesus was as they lined up in the thousands to be touched for just a moment of love that's how much he loves you As the music comes. A 
came across this a few years ago. And I've shared it here before. I'm going to share it again today because I feel like there's something about this story that really un- makes me understand what Jesus has called us into. In the book, The Star Thrower, the writer tells of the day where he was walking along a beach where thousands of starfish had been washed up. He noticed a boy picking up a starfish one at a time and throwing it back into the ocean. When he asked him why, the boy said, if I don't, they'll die. question that he asked the boy he said but how can saving so few make a difference when so many are doomed the little guy picked up another starfish and threw it back into the ocean and he said it makes a lot of difference to that one he left the boy and went back home to continue writing only find that he couldn't type a single word So he returned to the beach and spent the rest of the day helping that boy save a starfish. See, Jesus gives us the opportunity to be better than who we are. look at the story of the crucifixion of Jesus there was a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea and the Bible says that he was a disciple in secret died, the disciples that were in the open scattered and nobody was there to claim the body. So Jesus is dead and Joseph steps forward and says I'll take him on. I'll be that man that nobody else wants to be of his love for me let me return the love back to him the Bible tells us greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends what a day Sam what a horrible day that must have been to know that the man that you loved for three and a half years or a mom that saw him grow sat there and watched him bleed and die to feel the earthquake as the spirit of the Lord rumbled because of what had taken place darkness moving upon sun setting the day we like to sing about the day that's coming but think about that day but let me tell you something there was no more there's never been a beautiful day like that day because as even though the sun began to bow the stars didn't come out the earth began to quiver Those were not sad moments. Those were reverences for what the Lord was doing. Because it was finished. Your sin was dissolved. What the enemy desired to take you and destroy you, God's love moved in and settled it. No more price for you to have to pay. 
no more of a trial that you would have to go through and endure without God. You, you see, even at that time, you were not even allowed in the presence of the Lord. But now, through the mercy of God, we can go into the throne room boldly before the throne of grace and throw our hands up in the air and throw yourself at His mercy and say, God, I desire to throw my love back at your feet. all stand, every head bowed, every eye closed. God, you've talked to me about love for three or four days. It's been on my heart. I ask you, Lord, whomever it was that you were desiring to talk to, let it reach into their spirit right now. Let it settle. Let it grow roots. Let it dig deep. Let it be there, Lord. I'm going to open up this altar. I want you to come. And I want this to be a time in which you understand that all you have to do is accept the love of the Lord to come into you. There's steps of salvation, and we'll get into that, but what I'm telling you today is there's some saints in here that have followed the steps of salvation, and you have gone through some time in which you have doubted whether God really does love you. I'm opening this altar for you as well. Whoever else that just wants to reciprocate the love back to the Lord. To just make your way out of your pews, your seats. I love you, Lord. I love you, Jesus.
praise you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Praise him right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Get your announcements, men, if you're wanting to go to men's conference, please meet in the center or right over here in this far right section, right after uh, church with Brother Garleski to uh, get some information for that. Um, men's conference is a beautiful thing if you want to go. Ladies, don't forget the Ladies Fellowship. 
I have never had somebody look at me so mad as Sister Tracy did when I said, just make sure they cook before they go. So I will never make her mad again the rest of my life. She turned around on Brother Lewis. I can understand why you don't make that woman mad. She, 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 she looked at me. I'm like my father-in-law. I just like to pick a little bit. 